Uh, let me start with the first speaker that we have today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, uh, Professor Doc, um, Mark Kramer, uh, who is a director of the Cold War uh, Studies Program at Harvard University and a senior fellow of Harvard Davis Center for Russian and European Studies. Uh, Professor Kramer is also the author of many books and articles on a wide variety of topics in political science, history, and international relations. Uh, he is the author of the Journal of Cold War Studies, published by MIT Press, and um, of the Harvard Cold War Studies book series, published by Roman and Littlefield. Uh, he was the editor and translator of the Black Book of Communism, uh, published in 1999 uh, by uh, Harvard University Press. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Kramer. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I first of all want to say a couple of words about other participants. I'm, I'm especially pleased that Alexander Goryanov is here from Memorial, who, along with Natalia Lebedeva, have been uh, have done enormously valuable work and and courageous work in Russia over the last 20 years or so to document Katyn and to explain it and to secure the release of documents. I think we should all be grateful to them because at various times in Russia it has not been an easy topic to work on, especially over the last 10 years. Um, the tragedy last April changed that somewhat, but it, particularly until April of last year, it was a very difficult topic to work on. Uh, yet the two of them, Alexander Guryanov and Natalia Lebedev, have really done uh, enormously valuable work. So I'm delighted that he is here. I regret that Krzysztof Persak from Poland was unable to come also because of the weather. But I did, uh, I know Krzysztof well and um, coordinated somewhat what we were going to say. So I'll try to touch on a couple of things that he would have covered. Um, in addition to what I want to present. I'm going to put Katyn in context. I know that during the day we have many speakers who will address uh, interesting aspects of some of the legal issues involved and particularly uh, about possible adjudication of the, um, uh, of the whole matter. But the um, thing I want to look at is the political context of it, the international context of it, and to try to explain why I think that Stalin may have ordered the massacre. The, the, uh, the first thing, I, I, there's a short commentary that's in this booklet uh, that um, I gave at the Library of Congress last May, and that explains I, um, where I see some of the gaps in the documentation. The first point I would make, though, is that there has been an enormous amount released in Russia over the last 20 years. Again, in part through the efforts of people like Alexander Goryanov and Natalia Lebedeva. Also, another person who deserves great credit is Alec uh, Alexander Yakovlev, the former Politburo member under Gorbachev, who was one of the foremost reformers in the Soviet Union. He later on set up a foundation that try to um, expedite the declassification of important materials from the Soviet era. And among those topics was Katyn. There has been a vast amount released, and that's the first point I would make. I'm not convinced that there are too many secrets left, with a few exceptions, and I've explained what I think some of those are. Um, most of the materials available uh, at this point, I think, tell, give us a reasonably good picture of the situation in the Soviet Union, as, especially at that point. I'm not fully convinced. I know that there are many in Poland who think that there are still great secrets to be released about this. I'm not convinced of that. Um, I do think that in the state security archive in Russia that there are potentially things, um, especially about the identities of some of the perpetrators, 
to be revealed. But even there, there's a great deal that is known. Um, I do emphasize in that commentary the need to come fully uh, clean on the question of perpetrators. But even there, there's a great deal that's available. The uh, first thing I would emphasize is that in the context of so the, uh, the development of the Soviet Union under Stalin, that is from 1929 on, what happened at Katyn was not at all unusual. Um, in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, millions of people had died as a result of Stalin's policies. Some of these came during forced collectivization and decollectivization, that is the uh, forcible disbandment of peasants. Stalin used phrases that he wanted to exterminate the kulaks as a class. Kulak was a very expansive term used to refer to uh, supposedly middle class peasants. And the, the uh, millions of people died in those, as a result of those policies, including millions who died in famines in Ukraine, uh, southern Russia, and Kazakhstan. The, in addition, during the Great Terror from 1937 to 1938, a period of about 16 months, there were 800,000 people shot in the Soviet Union. You think of that, that's is an astonishing number. Um, it, it comes down to, uh, you're talking about there, there were so many people being killed, it was hard even at times to have the ammunition to do it. There, there were quotas set, but groups that were sent out to, to commit the shootings, again, these 800,000 people in the space of 16 months, um, would often try to exceed those quotas, just taking people indiscriminately. So in the context of Katyn, and, and by the way, I should add, the Great Terror, among others affected by it, were 110,000 ethnic Poles who were shot because they were ethnic Poles. Um, there were about 140,000 other people who were shot because they were particular nationalities. So in the context of the Soviet Union of the 1930s, what happened at Katyn is not at all unusual. In fact, it um, in some ways is less significant than some of the appalling atrocities committed in the Soviet Union during that point. Why is it then that we look back on Katyn uh, in the way we do? Part of it, clearly, which uh, again will be touched on at many points during the day, but is the official lies that surrounded it for decades under the Soviet Union, to some extent abetted by outside powers, but particularly in the Soviet Union, the systematic lying and cover-up that went on about the crime, that's clearly part of it. But another part of it is that this was an unusual practice in Soviet occupation policy. Again, bear in mind, part of the context for this is that uh, as a result of the August 1939 um, Nazi-Soviet pact and the secret protocol that was established shortly thereafter, the Soviet Union and Germany had divided Poland, uh, first with the German invasion and then 16 days later with the Soviet invasion of Eastern Poland. In both cases, the occupations were brutal. But at the same time, the Soviet Union at that point in Eastern Poland, it was, it was deporting large numbers of people to, uh, to Siberia and to points in, in the far north. <laughs> Um, close to about, in total, about 340,000 uh, Poles were sent to various points in the Gulag chain. But uh, it, generally, large scale massacres of the sort that occurred near Katyn Forest, um, at several sites near Katyn Forest, that was much more unusual. And in fact, eventually, even in Soviet, uh, even in the Stalinist Soviet, Union became recognized as such. So let me look a little bit then at why I think Stalin may have uh, may have ordered this. The first, and, and again, here I um, am drawing uh, on the work of Natalia Lebedeva in, in part, and also on some uh, work that I've done in the Russian archives in looking at, uh, especially some of the Philly 
recently declassified Stalin files, is the initial memorandum in dealing with these prisoners that were taken on the 20th of February, and, and again, you'll find some of the documents in, in this case book, but the, uh, or booklet, I should say. The, on the 20th of February, there was a memorandum um, that was prepared talking about how to dispose of these prisoners, but not in the sense of killing them. The idea was to deport them to Kamchatka, which was uh, in the Soviet Far East, which would have been a grim fate and probably a fair number would have died there, but it wasn't equivalent to shooting them. The, on the 27th of February, a week later, Beria met with Stalin. Um, there, so far, at least, I certainly have not come across any no, uh, notes from that meeting. Um, I don't think there are any, but, uh, but it is known from the appointment book that Stalin had that he met with Beria on the 27th. And then of course, and, and again, this document is reproduced in here, the famous 5th of March memorandum that Beria uh, had sent to Stalin and, and other members of the Soviet Politburo, which had Stalin's big signature across, along with the signatures of other Politburo members approving the execution of the prisoners. So what had changed between the 20th of uh, February and in just a little over um, two weeks by the 5th of March? And what uh, was it that Beria and Stalin may have discussed on the 27th of February? The context here, in addition to the division of Poland between the Soviet Union and, uh, and Nazi Germany, is that the Soviet Union had embarked at this point on a fairly brief but intense and bloody war with Finland. The Soviet-Finnish war, again, it lasted about three and a half months. In that period, almost 127,000 Soviet soldiers were killed. Um, it, it, part of that was the Soviet, Ar the Red Army was disastrously prepared for a war, in part because of the purges that had gone on in the Soviet high command from 1936 to 1938. The Soviet-Finnish war revealed how ill-prepared the army was. But again, if you think in three and a half months, 127,000 soldiers are killed, this is a war that is gaining uh, a considerable amount of attention at high levels in Moscow. France and Britain, uh, although again, Britain was fighting Germany at this point, but because Germany and the Soviet Union were um, not formally allied, but certainly working um, in close cooperation on the division of Eastern Europe, uh, France and Britain had teamed up to send a legation to, to Finland uh, to help fight the Soviet Union. The, uh, the head of the president of Poland at that point, Sikorski, um, had a Polish unit take part in that legation. Again, I'm, in, in, in trying to explain this, I'm trying to explain Stalin's rationale for it. I'm not trying in any way to uh, excuse what went on. But Sikorsky, among other things, according to intelligence reports that Stalin, well, actually Beria and Stalin saw, it's not clear which of them uh, took action on this, but according to intelligence memoranda they saw, the Sikorsky had said that one of the, his aims in sending this unit with the uh, British and French was to provoke an undeclared war against the USSR, essentially to bring the Soviet Union, um, it, to, to have it as a combatant hostile power along with Germany, it, against which Britain would fight and eventually other allied powers would fight. Now these memoranda in reaching uh, Beria, Stalin, and um, presumably other members of the Politburo, do um, seem to have been one of the factors in that period from the 20th of February 
to the 5th of March. It in no way, again, um, provides, and it doesn't diminish the magnitude of the crime at all, but I do think it helps to account for why it changed from deportation to extermination that with the presence of military, um, numerous members of the military elite, although I should emphasize something that in the video presentation wasn't quite right, there were also many civilians among those massacred at Katyn. Again, a list of those available makes that clear, is that it's not accurate to describe these as, military, as purely military officers. There were many military officers there, but there were large numbers of civilians beyond police as well. Um, so the, the uh, uh, but in that period, given that there were large numbers of key Polish military elites, Stalin seems, as he had done repeatedly in the Soviet Union, to have looked on mass killing as the solution for dealing with this in the context of this bloody soviet finnish war that was going on. Again, I, I puzzled over this for quite a while to try, in, including with Natalia Lebedeva, to try to figure out why Stalin ordered this, what seems like an aberrant practice in uh, in Soviet occupation policy. And this seems to have coincide, at least uh, correspond with the timing of the change in Soviet policy. Let me end by just mentioning a couple of other things about uh, current Russian archival policy. Alexander Goryanov will touch on some of this later, but let me just mention two qu quickly two key things. One of them is that, and Alexander I know will bring this up later, so I'll just mention it now, is last week uh, a, uh, the court in Russia in determining whether to release materials from the investigation that was launched first under the Soviet Union and then continued under the Russian government from 1990 through 2004, the court ruled that those documents did not have to be released, which was a setback for Memorial Alexander's organization that has sought the declassif full declassification of those materials. A lot of the materials gathered by that commission, however, were earlier published. And um, my sense is the most interesting thing still to be revealed in those documents is not what it would say specifically about Katyn, but what it would say about the decision in 2004 to halt this investigation. That had something to do with the Putin administration in Russia, and I'd like to know why the Putin administration halted the investigation. I don't think, though, that there are materials in those files that would greatly alter our understanding of Katyn, per se. Um, the other thing is, that I wanted to mention uh, by way of finishing is last week, uh, or actually I guess it was earlier this week, uh, the 1st of February, um, uh, President Medvedev in Russia had a meeting with a council called the Council for the Development of Civil Society and Human Rights, which is, the, um, it's an official governmental council, but some of the meetings they've had have been quite interesting. The head of that uh, council, Mikhail Fedotov, in confronting Medvedev at this meeting on the 1st of February, brought up specifically the question of declassification of archival documents. Um, and uh, he said that, again, um, if I can, I'm going to translate from Russian here. He says, uh, because it was one of the fetishes of the totalitarian system um, to emphasize extreme secrecy, then openness has to have the um, first priority for a state bound by law. That is why speaking about the overcoming of the um, atrocities of, the total of totalitarian thinking, the council um, draws your attention to the declassification of archival documents. And, they, and he goes on to say, um, first of all, I was heartened to see these words and to see them spoken directly to Medvedev because if anything is going to be achieved, it does have to be done at that level, the level of Medvedev or Putin. 
Um, but also, it does give, I think, some basis for challenging the Kuwait's decision of asking the uh, current government in Russia to overturn that and, in fact, to release those materials from 2004. So with that, in other, what I've uh, been trying to get at here then is to set Katyn in a political international context here and to talk also about the um, sources that are now available. Um, so with that, I'll be glad to take questions or, and I'll also be glad to, if anyone wants to, um, with Krzysztof Persak, who is going to cover more of the Polish side of things, we'll be glad to deal with that. Yeah, the 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 um, the manner of execution was fairly consistent with what the Soviet Union had done elsewhere. Um, Stalin did not. Uh, again, some of the NKVD documents are available in in um, the short presentation that I had. Uh, here that's included here. I did mention that the major area where some of the files are not yet available is on some of the operational things connected with how the executions were carried out, especially who specifically did some of the shootings. We know um, from uh, testimony of people that um, from quite a few years later who some of the, the shooters were and who some of the people transporting the prisoners and bringing them out individually were. But there's a considerable amount that is not yet available about that and that's where I would like to know more about who um, designed the specific manner of execution. But Stalin wouldn't have gotten involved in that level of detail. Um, even Beria wouldn't have gotten involved. That was more with the um, on-site commanders, and, and uh, in that presentation, I do mention who they are and uh, and give some of the specifics of how they went about that. But but as I say, the um, the the cruel manner of execution was quite standard for the Soviet Union at that point. <laughs> 